Lord, we just, we just ask that you would help us to let our mind and our heart and our focus be on you. Not on the situations, not on things, not on, on failures or, or past problems, but instead, Lord God, let our mind and heart be on you. You are the, the supplier of every need in our life. You are the, the, the author of the cosmos who created it all. You are the one that's in charge, Lord. So, Lord, we have every, every reason to have confidence. So confidently, Lord God, we come into your presence. And confidently, Lord, we lay all of these needs at your feet, that those that were mentioned and those that are just near and dear on our heart. Lord God, we lay all of these confidently in front of you and say, let your kingdom come and will be done in these things, Father. Because we want your will done. And Lord, we're declaring over the bodies to be healed in Jesus' name. Those that are hurting in their mind and their heart, struggling with death or loss or problems. God, we declare healing over that as well. And that, Father, that you are the way maker. The one who comes in and, and prepares a way for us before, Lord God, before the incident ever took happen. Took place. So, Lord, we're just believing right now you are in control. You are on the move and you are making a difference. And, Lord, we just pray on behalf of our nation that, Lord, you would forgive us of our sins. Forgive America, Lord God. Forgive us as Americans for things we do and how we act. And while, Father, there are national sins that are grieving your heart. And Lord, I didn't commit them at the same time. I have to say, Lord, forgive us because we live among you. And Father, we're just praying right now. Find your remnant and stir us up, Lord Jesus, that we can be a people of faith, a people of prayer, a people that believes God is still in control. And Father, we just want to give you the glory and the thanks right now in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Um, let me make a couple of announcements here real quick. We're going to be looking at the book of Ruth tonight. And uh, so while you're maybe turning there, um, what is today? The 5th, starting this coming Sunday, those that are in the Quest Bible study group or those that would like to be, uh, they're going to be studying uh, a new thing called the Forgotten God. Um, by Francis Chan, and uh, this will be uh, a video series, and uh, so looking to hear some good reports on this. I like Francis Chan, and uh, uh, that'd be a good study for y'all to be a part of. Have you celebrated National Air Conditioner Day this week? <laughs> that's that's a perpetual holiday right now. It just keeps on going. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so let me just say it for the record the brisket was outstanding and yes give me a hand and whoever made the chicken and dumplings your place is assured in heaven because the Lord wants that fixed for the marriage supper of the Lamb I'm just saying was that you Chana? all right Bubba was trying to take some credit, and I said, I know better. I know better. So, all right. But it was all good and all fantastic. All right. So, um, I guess that's it. Uh, don't forget, we do have a back-to-school bash coming up in August, as well as our vacation Bible school. And uh, we do have our, our shrimp boil and potluck. This will be on a Sunday evening. We'll all come back to church and because uh, having no church is better when you just have food. Uh, hallelujah. So those of you that would like to be a part of the shrimp boil, that, that is going to be $10 per person. Potluck, bring whatever you want to bring and, and have with it or in place of it. But uh, if you do, if you would like to eat some shrimp uh, and all the fixings, the corn, potatoes, sausage, whatever, whatever they put in there, uh, please see Bubba Parrish. $10 per person, and uh, because we kind of need to pay for some of that uh, beforehand. So, all right. Did y'all enjoy Alvarado Road Show? You enjoyed the dance? Would it be okay if we held the dance at a cooler time of the year? Although, we didn't suffer. Let's just, 
be real, God God helped us dodge a bullet that night, and it, it was great. And uh, uh, but I I think if we do another one, we're going to do it maybe in the fall of the year or something. And uh, all right, very good. Well, so as we dig into the book of Ruth. Really what this is about is we've got a couple of Sunday school classes that are going to be starting up in September that are dealing with Bible engagement, how to study the Bible, how to get all up into it. And that's part, something that's dear to my heart because the, the Bible says that we are destroyed by our ignorance and specifically the ignorance of the Word of God. And so wanting to help us to be engaged in the Bible, there's some kind of a series we're doing right now in the summertime is just going over some things that are in the Bible. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. Maybe there's something that we can teach in what we're doing that would cause you to fall in love with the Word of God all over again and say, man, I really want to read that book. I really want to have it. How many, how many just like the Bible? How many want to go to heaven? How many like the Bible? Okay, we got more amens that time. I just thought I'd ask. All right. So, when you're reading through the Bible, one of the most depressing accounts of the whole thing is the book of Judges. Book of Judges is terrible. There's a lot of action. That's cool. But there's a lot of spiritual failure. Uh, looks a lot like America right now and, and many nations around the world at the moment. The temperature of Israel's spiritual demeanor can be summed up in one verse in Judges chapter 21 where it says, In those days Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. It seemed right in their own eyes. And that's, that's a, a, a very sort of a poignant phrase to me because that kind of typifies the modern American way of living for Jesus. Instead of being engaged with the Word of God and what the Word of God says, we live according to what is right in our own life. Well, I feel like it's okay to do this. Or I feel like, you know, it's all right. And we will excuse things that God does not excuse. My son had a, uh, my oldest son is dealing with an issue right now where uh, there's apparently a group his church hosts uh, a community gathering at Christmas time, and there's a group that is, are not Christian, and they were allowed to come up in his church on the platform and sing a, a Christmas carol. Uh, but it, it, it's it's a group that no, you you can't do that. And the community leaders think this is okay, but my son says this is a spiritual service, and it's not okay. And I like what he said, very, very intelligent for his years, where he said, everybody is welcome on my, in my church, but not everybody is welcome on my platform. Amen. And uh, I, I respected him for that. You have to have the sense of what is right and what is good and what is acceptable. So following the depressive state of judges comes this lovely little book, the book of Ruth, uh, a lot of times it's studied in university literature classes uh, for its elegance uh, and its prose. Um, one German writer said it's the loveliest complete work on a small scale. Uh, very high praise for a secular person. It's the ultimate love story uh, in, in the literary sense. Boaz falls in love with Ruth, but in the prophetic sense, Jesus falls in love with with us is what it is. Did you understand? Have you ever thought about the book of Ruth as a prophetic book? Prophetic. God was giving, giving mankind a glimpse as to what His agenda is through a love story tucked away in the Old Testament. Something that Jesus was going to accomplish. So this is a story about Jesus long before Jesus ever drew breath here on earth. So the book of Ruth is one of the most significant books in the Old Testament, I believe, to the modern church. It explains the role and mission of what's called the Goel. And you're going to learn that one here in a minute. That is the kinsman redeemer. Goel is Hebrew for kinsman redeemer. 
And uh, uh, if you before you read Revelations chapter five, you really have to understand the book of Ruth. Well, what's Revelations chapter five? I'm so glad you asked. Let me show you. Revelations chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. This There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll. Be careful when you read the Bible at surface level because you miss something. If you understand scrolls, you don't write on both sides of the scroll because the outer side is going to get damaged. And yet, here's a scroll that says it was written on on the inside and the outside. What does that mean? It means coffee and brownies. Get you some coffee, some brownies, and, and just begin to tear into some of this right here. And it says, it was sealed with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to, to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if he had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns, seven eyes, and represented the sevenfold <clears throat> Spirit of God that is sent out to every part of the earth. He stepped forward, took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. Please remember this picture when we get into the book of Ruth later on because it's... There's a powerful, a powerful picture here of what took place. There's nobody worthy until one said, no, wait, there is one who is worthy and able and willing. Worthy, able, and willing. So, Book of Ruth, let's break it down real quick. Uh, uh, chapter 1 can be called Love's Resolve. Uh, uh, this is where Ruth cleaves to Naomi. Uh, the second one is love's response with the gleaning of the field and the meeting with, uh, with uh, Boaz. Uh, chapter 3 would be love's request, the threshing floor scene that takes place. And then in chapter 4 would be love's reward, which is the redemption, interestingly, the redemption of the land and of the bride. Of the land and of the bride. And so let's look at Ruth's cleaving here in Ruth chapter 1, uh, verse 1. It says, In those days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with them. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was named Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But ten years later, both Malon and Kilion died. That left Naomi alone with her two sons, uh, without her two sons or her husband. So here's the highlights because we're not going to dig into the whole chapter. But you have to remember when it says in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, that actually gives us a timeline. This is going to be somewhere uh, uh, around 1000 B.C. when this uh, story actually occurred. Moab is just east of Bethlehem. Uh, but it was untouched by the famine. The famine seemed to stay within the borders of Israel. Do you understand God will allow things to happen to His people if His people need to get their attention gotten? Think about that. Elimelech, uh, who is the husband or, and the father, his name is God is my king. That's what Elimelech means. Naomi's name means pleasant. And, uh, uh, but then they had these two boys. And I want you to see this because remember what I said. A name is a self-fulfilling prophecy. They had two sons. The first one's name was Malon, which means unhealthy or to blot out. I'm going to name my child sickly. I'm, 
I'm going to name my child Worthless. I mean, this is roughly what those names meant. Kilion means puny and to perish. He was the runt of the litter, I guess, but, but of the two. And uh, that was their names. Uh, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. These kids are not going to live long on the earth. We don't, and we don't know what that is. Now, they could have been born with some kind of an issue. They could have been born with sickness. And so their name reflected it. I don't know. I don't want to name my child Lupus, but, you know. Within 10 years, all the men are dead, but Israel is now renewed. Uh, there's, there's bread in the house of bread again. And so, and, and then we see Ruth's dedication. You close it up with Ruth's dedication to her mother-in-law. And uh, chapter 1, verse 16 says, But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back wherever you go. I will go wherever you live. I will live. Your people will be my people and your God. Pay attention to that. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. I think the hero of this particular relationship here is Ruth. Because Naomi is a very bitter mother-in-law. She's a very negative mother-in-law. How many of you have bitter, negative mother-in-laws? Let me see your hands. Okay, I see two. Thank you. Everybody else like, seriously? Did he just ask that? But Ruth, ladies, if you've got sons, you need to be praying for God to send your boy a woman like Ruth. Who will not only love her husband, but will love you. That we're not the in-laws, we're the in-loves. Now, surprisingly, it's very interesting. When she makes this statement, your God will be my God. The term is, your Yahweh will be my Yahweh. She actually calls God by His Hebrew name. And, uh, uh, and it's interesting because her commitment's rooted to an understanding of Yahweh. Well, where did she learn about Yahweh? From her mother-in-law. From her mother-in-law because that's how it happened. Women were insignificant in their roles in the house. And so women taught women versus men teaching the women. And uh, so where would Ruth have learned it? From her mother-in-law. So that means there was actually some good in her mother-in-law. Don't read the bitter part too hard on her. All right, chapter 2, we're hustling along. Chapter 2 talks about the law of gleaning, uh, uh, which is in Leviticus chapter 19, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Those two are very important for this story if you do a little bit of your history. Because this was a form of welfare. The law of gleaning was. It was a way of providing for those that don't have anything. If you own a field, your reapers could go through the field once. That's it. You couldn't go back there a second time. Whatever was missed was meant for the widows and the orphans and the strangers that were in Israel. And so you couldn't take everything. You had to leave something for those that, were, that had nothing. You know what's interesting to me about this? Is that when you look at God's biblical form of welfare, it doesn't mean you get something for nothing. If you want it, it's right out there. You still got to go get it. Hello? What does the Bible say? If a man will not work, he will not. Reach over to your neighbor and just kind of nudge him a little bit. Say, I know the, the dessert was good and, and the dumplings were wonderful, but you really need to wake up. You really need to wake up. Y'all are, are getting really quiet on me here. Now, it's in, what, another interesting part is when you read chapter 2, it says that Ruth happened upon the field that belonged to Boaz. How do you know with God, there is no happens upon? It is a because of. God knew what needed to happen, and uh, He made sure that she showed up at the right field uh, in the right place because it was possible. Again, it's not like they were living holy lives in Israel at that time. And uh, it was possible as a single a uh, foreign woman to be out there in that field, she could be harassed. That's why the command was given, do not harass this woman. Think about that. Now, Boaz, uh, his name means in him is strength. 
That's actually the name of one of the two pillars that are in uh, uh, Solomon's temple. One of, those, one of those two pillars is called Boaz, meaning in him is strength. What's funny is when that, that's going to become Ruth's next husband. What was her previous husband's name? Unhealthy. <laughs> to blot out. To wipe away. Mold on the, on the sandwich bread. And she's going to go from moldy and unhealthy to in him is strength. <laughs> now, that just sounds like a Hallmark movie right there. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, he was a wealthy landowner. He may have been a primary leader among the, the, uh, what would be the city council when it says the men at the gate. That was the place where you would find like a city council happening. There was actually special seats. Uh, that if you go to Israel, you can see some of these things in the old in the old ruins. That there were seats that uh, that men would sit at there at the gate at a place of commerce, and they were the ones that would be like the town elders, the city fathers. And so, because he had a place there, because he was known there, it very well may be he could have been, you know mayor at one time or something, but he was an important civic leader. He was introduced to this woman by an unnamed servant. Uh, uh, that's just like what the Holy Spirit does. We talked about that with Isaac and Rebecca. And uh, so there's a picture of the Holy Spirit introducing them. And she must have caught Boaz's eye because again, he said, you will protect this young woman and not harass her. And secondly, it says, and I believe this may be King James Version, you will leave handfuls on purpose. Meaning as you gather, just take a scoop out and throw it on the ground. That No, you didn't just miss something. You're now, I mean, this looks like a Central Texas deer food plot. You got, you got piles of, of, of stuff right here. And uh, how, many, how many of you have ever heard of Jensen Franklin? The pastor, Jensen Franklin? Jensen Franklin talked about, he preached about Boaz and how women want their Boaz. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard it. Ladies, you may have even said it. I wish I had my Boaz. And uh, uh, I, I would love to play the clip, Ben, but I'm afraid I didn't have the clip. But this is the transcription of what he said regarding uh, Boaz. To all the girls who are in a hurry to have a boyfriend or to get married, a piece of biblical advice. Ruth patiently waited for her mate Boaz. So while you're waiting on your Boaz, don't settle for any of his relatives. Broke ass, po ass, lion ass, cheating ass, dumb ass, drunk ass, cheap ass, locked up ass, good for nothing ass, lazy ass, and especially his third cousin beating your ass. Wait on your Boaz and make sure he respects your ass. Now, <laughs> let's just be clear. I didn't say that. Jensen Franklin said that. And uh, <laughs> But I will say there's some good truth locked up in that statement right there. Ooh, okay, bring the Holy Spirit back in. So, the uh, Dr. Chuck Missler, in his study, Learned the Bible in 24 Hours, uh, talks about this particular story. And it deals with what's called the law of redemption and the law of Levite marriage. This is where we talked about going back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Dr. Missler says it this way. He says, It so happened that Boaz was a kinsman for Naomi's family, which is why this is so important to us. The law of redemption said that when somebody sold their property, they actually sold only the rights to the property, not the title, because the title belonged to God. If you died, a kinsman of your family could go and pay the money to redeem the land. Naomi had sold her property ten years before. Now they were back, but since she was destitute and couldn't buy it back, a kinsman of hers would have the right to purchase the land from whoever was using it. This is the law of redemption from Leviticus 25. There is also the law of Levite marriage. If you were a widow without an issue, you could ha ask your nearest kinsman to raise up issue with you, have a child with you. He didn't have to, but if he did, it would then continue on the line. 
Uh, and that's from Deuteronomy 25. This picture of the kinsman redeemer in Hebrew, this is a title called the Goel. That is the person who, who is going to make sure the land is bought back and given back to the family. And uh, if, if a woman died and did not have kids, because again, there really wasn't a good welfare system. And so if a woman did not have children, she did not have anybody to take care of her in her older age. Now, uh, let's move on to chapter, chapter number th uh, 3. In chapter 3, Naomi recognizes an opportunity for the redemption of her land and for a new life for Ruth. So that Lu Ruth is too young to just be a widow. She, she can still bear children and do good. So she instructs Ruth on what to do. So Ruth approaches Boaz to fulfill this role as they go out, the, the kinsman redeemer. And so Dr. Missler says this. He said, that night the men worked the threshing floor. Now the threshing floor was a parcel of ground, typically in a saddleback area where there was a prevailing breeze. They took the, the grain uh, uh, and threshed it and threw it in the air. Now if they did it properly, the wheat would fall nearby and the chaff would fall uh, further downwind, making two distinct piles. The, the first pile was bagged and prepared for market. The second one was burned as trash to get rid of vermin. But all of this could not be completed in one night. The landowner and his key people typically slept by the grain. And so we actually see this in Ruth chapter 3. It says, after Boaz finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over, and he was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. Now, Ruth, when she said in, uh, to put your covering, uh, uh, King James says your skirt, place your skirt over me. This is often misunderstood because of people that are unfamiliar with the customs of the time. The hem was a symbol, the very hem of the garment down there at the bottom was a symbol of authority similar to putting a, a, a patch on a sleeve right here. If you see the chevrons or the rockers, you can tell what... what uh, uh, what rank a soldier is. But it was the same thing in that day. You looked at the hem of the garment and if it was richly adorned, if it was very poor and ratty and dirty, you could always tell something about a person by looking at the hemline uh, of, their, of their cloak, of their garment. And uh, so in that culture, stature and authority were represented by what you wore. Dress for success is what we call it today and uh, so that's why when the woman had the issue of blood in the new testament it, it says that she could uh, she felt if i could just touch the what now she could have touched the sleeve she could have touched the back she could have touched anything but her thought was if i could just touch the place of his authority is somebody seeing this she knew something if I can just touch that place of authority, I'll be healed. And uh, um, God says to Israel in another place, says he, God tells Israel, I will put my skirt over you, meaning that He gives His protection to Israel. There's no improper, uh, there's some who like to read into this that some hanky-panky happened out there, and that's not what happened. Again, if you understand, this is a prophetic picture of Jesus and the church. You can't read no hanky-panky in that, because that's not the character of Jesus Christ. And so th this, was, this was very above board, and uh, she was asking, uh, um, she was Literally asking him to marry her. She went to him and said, I, I want you to marry me. I want you, I'm asking you to take me as your Leverite bride and put your authority over my house. Be that person. And he was flattered. He's a lot older than her and she's a lot cuter than him. And he's like, I don't see a loss in my side of this bargain at all. And, uh, but one, something he did learn about her was she had a good reputation. And that was valuable in that day. And he wanted to do this, but there was a problem. There was a nearer kinsman than I, he said. 
but relax, we're going to see this thing all the way through. And so, if you read the end of that story, okay, at the end of the story, it says that when she goes to leave the threshing floor, he says, hold out your garment, sack, whatever, and he puts grain in there. Can somebody remember how many scoops of grain he gave her? Six. Think about this. When she saw that, it, it, it says she went back and described what happened. Oh, and he gave me six scoops of grain. Immediately she got excited. Naomi got excited because it was a message. It was a message that was being given. And Naomi got it. How many days did it take for uh, God to create the world? Six. What did He do on the next day? He rested on the seventh. So he worked for six and rested on the seventh. He gave her how many scoops of grain? He was saying, I'm not going to stop working on this until it is resolved. There was no seventh. Why? Because there was no break. He said that what he was telling her is I, just as God was at work for six days, I'm going to keep working on this until it's taken care of. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right, chapter 4. Let's get through this so we can, you can go home and have yourself some more chicken and dumplings. Ruth 4. Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. Just then the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So Boaz called out to him, Come over here and sit down, friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Then Boaz called ten leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. Boaz said to the family redeemer, You know Naomi who came back from Moab. She is selling the land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away because I am next in line to redeem it after you. I kind of got a feeling Boaz is pretty shrewd because he talks about the land, but he doesn't talk about the woman. He saves that. The man replied, well, all right, yeah, more land, I'll do it. Then Boaz told him, of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires for you to marry Ruth, the Moabite widow. Could have just said widow. Could have just said Naomi's widow, but no, he threw Moabite in there. But what's the big deal? Tell you what, if you redeem this land, you'll get the land. And that woman from New York City. <laughs> that, that, you get the idea there now? Okay. All right. So this was not a pleasant thing. This was not a nice comment. And he did that on purpose. He did that on purpose. Why? Because I think he knew this man is not going to take it. And uh, I'm going to make her look really bad so then I can have her for myself. <laughs> Guys, that is not romantic, okay? Just telling you, it's not romantic. That, that way she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. Then I can't redeem it, the family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land, I can't do it. The children that, are, that you inherit through Leverite marriage, whether she has kids or you create kids in this secondary marriage, uh, uh, those have access to your estate. When they become a part of the family, they become a part of the family. That's how God intended it for it to be. These are not your stepkids. These are your kids. And uh, so they got a piece of the pie in the will. And so you have, a, you have a man who's like, I don't want these kids who are not my kids to get what I have and take away from my children. Where I had two kids, now I got eight kids. And, and no, I'm not going to do that to my children. So that's why there was there were some people who are qualified. They could do it, but they did not desire to do it. And uh, uh, the unnamed man, this man uses his shoe as a covenant sign that he was yielding the opportunity uh, to Boaz. That that was the sign. Basically, that was the 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 marriage license for Ruth and Boaz was this guy's sneaker. 
They framed it and hung it on the wall. <laughs> this is where we got married. Ruth, that was a joke. That was just a joke. Okay. Yep. Ruth, uh, uh, in, in verse 10, it says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, Malon, have I purchased to be my wife? I have purchased her to be my wife. Now, before you get all upset about that, some of you ladies, there's actually a beautiful picture here. A very beautiful picture. So, Dr. Missler, wrapping this up, he says, now let's look at the book of Ruth from the perspective of a Goel. He is the kinsman redeemer. What are the requirements of a kinsman redeemer? He has to be a kinsman. They've got to be related. And he must be able to perform that duty. And he must be willing to perform that duty. And he must uh, assume all the obligations that come with this entire package. God has a goel for you and for me. He has a kinsman. He, is, uh, he has to be a kinsman of Adam. He must be able to perform uh, uh, the action necessary of redeeming the land. Revelations 5 is about the seventh sealed book, which is literally the title deed of the earth. It's the title deed of the earth. Where who gave it away? Adam did. Now the other son of God is going, what was called the second Adam, is now going to purchase the land back. No one was found uh, to claim that deed. It had to be a man. Had to be a man. And, and John sobbed convulsively because no man was found to redeem the earth. But wait, there was one who prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book. And that unfolds in the story of Ruth. That's what we see right there. Is that there was a man who was able to do the job, was willing to do the job. He had to be a kinsman. He had to be able. He had to be willing. He had to be. Uh, uh, he must assume all the obligations. And indeed, he has. Not only did he do it, but Jesus Christ did it as well when he said, it is finished. That's what made him now the kinsman redeemer of mankind was because of his willingness in action. In order for Ruth to be joined to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled out of her land. And nobody wants to leave their land. Nobody wants to leave their place of blessing. So how do you know if God wants you someplace, He's going to make you miserable here and make you want to get over there. That may explain some of the moves some of you had in your life. God desired it. So Naomi had to be exiled from her land. The nearer, the nearer kinsman couldn't take Ruth. It was against the law for an Israelite to marry a Moabite. It's against the law for an Israelite to marry a Moabite. Her first husband was what? An Israelite that broke the law. Her second husband became what? An Israelite who broke the law. This woman had a habit of dragging down some good Israelite men. No, no, that's not it. But what the law could not do, grace did. What you're seeing is a picture of grace. She's a Moabite. She doesn't deserve it. But you know what? We want to. We fell in love with her. We want to provide for her. And so, the, uh, uh, Ruth did not replace Naomi. Uh, uh, there, there are differences. They are both distinct. Israel and the church are distinctive. Uh, um, uh, different origins, different missions. Ruth learned the laws of Israel through Naomi, a Jew. Uh, uh, in this picture of Ruth, Naomi is a picture of Israel. Ruth is a picture of the Gentile world, uh, of us. Ruth learned about the laws of Israel through Naomi, a Jew. We Gentiles learn the ways of God by understanding Jewish scriptures. We worship a Jewish king in a church composed of Jewish leaders using a Jewish Bible as our authority. That's what we go back to. It's very much a beautiful, uh, uh, similar picture. In the threshing floor scene, no matter how much, now this is interesting, no matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, all he could do was respond to her move. He couldn't make the ask. She had to make the ask. The law of Leverite marriage, the woman had to ask the man. And so 
He, he waited for her to move and Boaz took it upon himself to be her advocate. He was her intercessor and he confronted the nearer uh, kinsman. This is why we approach Jesus as our Savior. He is our Redeemer, but He cannot redeem until we are ready and willing to be redeemed. He could not be the kinsman redeemer until Ruth was ready and willing to marry him and have him as, as her husband. Isn't that fascinating? But that's who Jesus was for us. That's why we say that the book of Ruth is very much a prophetic picture. It's a book of prophecy written hundreds, hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. Here's this story of Jesus and His mission and what He's going to accomplish in you and I. Tucked away in a Harlequin romance novel in the Old Testament. How beautiful is that? Come on. You see, that's what the Bible is. The Bible is nuggets of gold that are waiting to be mined, waiting to be found. Good stuff that the Lord is ready to, to blow our minds with if we're willing to read it right. Anytime you're reading Scripture and something doesn't set right, don't just gloss over it. If you hit a speed bump, stop and drill down. There's probably something down there that you need to see. I, I, I wish, I wish, I wish. It's, and it's so easy to have all these things that pastors had to study for years. Anybody now can have it on their cell phone. That you can look up uh, uh, when Ruth says, uh, and your God will be my God. Well, I wonder what she said. What does she mean by God right there? Because the Moabites had a bunch of gods. But then when you look it up, Strong's Concordance app on your phone. You look up that scripture, and there's the words, click on it. Hebrew, Yahweh God. Here was a Moabite calling God by His real name because she was now ready to dedicate herself to the Lord. Fascinating. Fascinating. So I pray that, guys, we have to be a people of the Word. And I'm saying that to myself as much as I say it to y'all. And I, you're here on a Wednesday night in the middle of the summer. You're all going to heaven anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> but the, the Bible is our source of light and life having that tight relationship with Jesus in prayer and in spirit, we have to have that. And there's a reason the American church is very anemic today. If you'll watch, churches are splitting. They're going one of two ways. Churches are either really healthy and really growing, or they're really not and they're really dying. If you watch, it's the thinning of the herd. It's the sheep and the goats. I don't want to be a goat. I don't know about you. I don't want to be a goat. I want to be one that loves God, is passionate about God. Am I perfect? No. But you know what? God still loves me. God still works in my life. God still uses us. God still speaks to us. God still shows us things. If we're willing to be there. If we're willing to be there. I want to be one of them. I want this church to be one of them. We are hungry to follow God. Doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means we're forgiven. Don't beat yourself up when you make mistakes. Just come to Jesus. Say you're sorry. Let Him love on you. And move on. Move on. So Lord Jesus, I just pray right now. that you would help us to fall in love with you all over again. Lord, help us to pray this independently of ourselves. Lord, I pray it for myself. Help me to fall in love with you deeper and more again. Help me, Lord God, to want you and your word and, and your ways. Help me, Lord God. To never think of it as a burden, but always to think of it as a blessing. Lord, I pray that you would go with us and stir us, Lord. Stir us to want you. Stir us to want to 
hear you and be with you. Forgive me of my, of my sins, Lord God. Forgive us of our sins. Because there's no one perfect here. But Lord God, we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I just ask right now, Lord God, that you, as you redeem us and you hold us and you keep us, fill us with your Spirit. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with you, Lord God. Because what we need more than anything else is you. Lord, I love you. I adore you. I want you. Watch over us as we leave church tonight. Lord, give us all safe trips home. I pray that you'd give us a wonderful rest of this week. Father, watch over us and keep us. Refresh our minds and our hearts and put somebody in our path that who knows, maybe we can invite them to church Sunday and they find Jesus for themselves. Lord, I just want to give you glory and thanks right now. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. amen. So Sunday had uh, a neighbor lady came up to me not from America. The churches in her homeland were not friendly. They were not loving. They did not celebrate a loving God. It was nothing. She said, this is so foreign to me. And the best thought we have is, doesn't know Jesus as her Savior, but really loved being at this church and is wanting to know more about all this. Can somebody be praying with me that we can see somebody? I, 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 I was telling, telling one, I said, uh, I would rather have that than somebody that just jumps from church to church to church to church, grasshopping around trying to find something that tickles their fancy. Give me somebody that hasn't known Jesus in their entire life. Come, I mean, that's like sliding into home plate in the ninth inning. You know what I'm saying? You made it. So... Stand with me if you would. Don't forget all the things we got coming up. Don't forget all the announcements. But most of all, don't forget that you're sitting next to somebody that really, really likes you. Turn to whoever's next to you. Give them a hug. Give them a handshake. Tell them you're glad you got to be with them. Y'all have a good night. Get your kids and your dishes and go home.